One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> Welcome back to the Racial Draft Podcast. I am your host, Michael Ford, not joined this week by the Kia Lisi. Hopefully she uh, pops in um, for some time. You know, she's out there doing uh, queenly duties as the, uh, as the ruler of the podcast universe. But we have, all, we have been joined by the main delegate from the white delegation, Gordy. Gordy, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Oh, I like it. I'm the main delegate. This is, this is an upgrade. <laughs> don't don't let it get to your head don't let it go to your head oh it's it's long past that i've already i've already i'm already making decrees i'm i'm, I'm gonna start calling myself the magistrate well hopefully you don't do, you know self-design a shield and go out there meeting out justice you know um you know you gotta you gotta scale back the scale back the privilege just a little bit but uh Listen, you know my my DIY shield would hold up, all right? I would make out uh, use Coke cans or whatever uh, whatever it was on, on good old Winter Falcon. Yeah, and that's a plug for our uh, Winter Falcon uh, Winter Falcon pod- podcast. If you're a longtime listener and you're an MCU fan, you should definitely check out those episodes as we, uh, you know, we, we get into just a little tiny bit of the nonsense, but we, you know, get involved in the review of, uh, industrial complex the mcu content machine goes on so we're gonna miss those uh we're gonna have those seven weeks without mcu content and uh it'll be dry you'll only have this podcast but speaking of this podcast we're going to do what we do every week and that is change the complexion of the comic book universe one draft pick at a time but before we do that with our supplemental draft we're going to talk about some of the uh the fcl fantasy comics league scoring shout out to those guys for getting the points to us uh on time uh still of course unofficial which means there could be adjustments points here and there but are you ready to find out gordy who won the week i am excited i'm hoping i'm hoping that this was a week of superman and sewer boy just doing everything. <laughs> well, as always, we start bottom to top. So starting at the bottom with 17 points, the Jewish delegation. Oh, that- started, started from the bottom and now we back on the bottom. <laughs> so eight points. They were led by Captain Marvel. Uh, three points with Bat, uh, Batgirl. And then a whole bunch of twos and ones leading, leading up to 17 points in total for the Jewish delegation. Next up with 21 points, the Polynesian delegation. Ah, Tomati. Tomati, shout out Tomati. Seven points for Ironheart. Strong, you know, strong even setup. I think, let me look at it. I think they got the full, uh, you know, that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of their characters scored this week, which is good, which is very good, but still only 21 points to show for it. Next yeah, up. Spreading the low, but not, uh, but not, not spreading it quite uh, thick enough. <laughs> exactly. Uh, next up with 24, actually, wait, tied, two delegations were tied Oops. with 24 points. Not me, not me, not me, not me. <laughs> and uh, I could make a very inappropriate joke, but I'm going to let the imagination fill that in. That is the South Asian delegation and the Native American delegation. Uh, oh. With 24 points in total. So uh, the uh, Native American delegation was led by Carnage, who put up 10 points. Uh, also Lex Luthor, Lex Luthor and Venom put up five points each and uh echo hey remember echo but 24 hey! points. <laughs> 24 points in total for the for that delegation i think there was a carnage uh red white and red book or something like that where i'm sure he he did a lot of bloody things you know it sounds about right uh cart carney b i guess i call him these is bloody shoes 
Um, and the South Asian delegation led by 16 points from Jean Grey. Big week for Jean Grey, 24 points in total. Uh, four points for Doctor Strange, two points for Black Canary, one point for Gambit, and one bonus point uh, due to her television show for Supergirl. So it was a lot of lot of Jean Grey this week from the, from the South Asian delegation, but 24. Um, brings us to the middle of the pack, right there sitting in Uh-oh. the middle. Sitting in the middle, the East Southeast Asian delegation with 30 points in total. Those three points were scored by Peter Parker, Jessica Drew, and Steve Rogers, 14, 13, and three for the grand total of 30 points. And that's oh. the Southeast Asian delegation. So they didn't really spread it out. They just uh, concentrated their concentrated their scoring on their big guns. There you go. I mean, listen, it, whatever gets it done, gets it done. So we are into our final four, Gordy. Our final four. Yeah. Yeah. And we know which delegation has not been named yet. So we're going to continue as you wait. The Latin X delegation in fourth place. Oh, Carlos is falling. With 35 points. Can you guess who their leading scorer was, though? Oh, let me take a deep, deep think of all of their amazingly high scoring characters. I'm going to guess it was Deadpool. <laughs> nope. It was nope, Batman. It, it, was, it Batman. was Batman. But who was their number two it's scorer, exactly. Cordy? The number two scorer. Number two. Let's go. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna say Deadpool. I'm going to say Kingpin. In fact, it was Catwoman. Finally, Ow. Selena Kyle puts up double digits with ten points as Batman put up Finally fourteen showing points. Up. I know. So thirty-five points in total, led by Batman and Catwoman, the power couple of power couples. Um, one of these days, I'm gonna have to total up which uh, traditional uh, tag teams uh, put up the highest uh, possible uh, team scores. But, you know, Batman's carrying the the hefty end of, of that that's that tandem. But yeah, so uh, Green La- Green Arrow, sorry, Green Arrow, Blade, Hawk Girl, and Kingpin did the rest of the scoring for the 32, sorry, 35 points in total. Which brings us to our final three. You know what that means? Final three, all in the yeah, 40s. No. All in the 40s, the final three. So scoring adjustments could could change how these things these things uh, end up. But before we get our scoring adjustments, number three, the black delegation. This week, I, I can't call them any of the other uh, derogatory names that I that I call them because they are decidedly in the front of the bus. So it is the it is the 21st century. Uh, black points matter, and. Uh, <laughs> to the team of 42 points, led by Black Dick himself, Nightwing. Seven points for Black Kamala Khan, Ms. Marvel. And six points for Black Panther. Also putting in points were Professor X, the Black Knight, Emma Frost, Black Adam. Two points for Krakoa! Krakoa, coming through! Coming through! Krakoa. Oh man, this is a week. This is the week. This is the week. This was the week. And you know what it, this also means? We're battling out the final two, the white delegation, the multiracial delegation. One of these and two that means scored that, that means 45, that- and the other one scored 48. Would you like to guess which was which? I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to be braggadocious and say that, that, that I scored 48, that the white delegation is in the lead. You would be correct, sir. With 45 oh, look at that. in second place is the multiracial delegation, led by 13 points from Barry Allen, nine points from She-Hulk, nine points from Quentin Quire, seven points for Valkyrie, five points for Damian Wayne, one point for Magic, and one point for Wolverine. Conveniently, or not conveniently, surprisingly absent from scoring for the first week possibly ever zero points for wonder woman wow wow i know that's a that that is a surprise i remember we talked in the beginning of the season 
and we said that I didn't that we didn't think anybody could win without the uh, without a member of the DC Trinity and Ma Wonder Woman not bringing it this week. Yeah, I mean, not being in the Justice League and not being in um, you know not having her her digital book come out this week for I think the first week this month. Um, you know, finally did her in. You know, she didn't get a random guest starring role in anything. So there it is. The first zero from Wonder Woman. Uh, let's pour out a little bit for that. I'm sure Kia, wherever she is, as she's listening to this, is fine. Is, is, is maybe, maybe she's disappointed, but maybe she's cackling to herself because it didn't happen on her watch. But 45 points for the multiracial delegation. So this is your opportunity, Gordy, to take a bow with 48 points, including one point from Colossus. Colossus. Colossus, Colossus, Colossus has scored. He's in. He's back. He's repping for the white delegation. One point for Colossus. But the leading, the leading scorer for you was Superman. 17 points for Superman, followed by 10 points for Magneto. Nine points for Miles Morales, six points for Superboy, five points for Wally West, and that one point for Colossus for a grand total of 48 points. Feels good, doesn't nice. it? Nice. It does. And there's not even bonus points this week because Superman and Lois is on break. That's right. So we're about to live on the podcast. Live on the podcast, we're going to do the. Uh, the, the score we're going to figure out the scoring for like who's in the lead in the overall in the overall scoring yeah that's what i was going to say i believe the the carlos in the latinx delegation was number one going in i believe and so, and i also believe that that uh multiracial and and our whites have uh have, have cut the lead this week <laughs> So I'm going to go in the order of where they where they where they were um, going into this week. Uh, obviously, bottom to top. So starting out last week's um, the last place team as of last week was the Native American delegation. They scored 24 points this week. Therefore, give me a second. Uh oh. Yeah, they weren't. They weren't last this week. They were not. Echo, um, bring in the heat. You know what? I'm going to have to do it this other way because. Uh Uh-oh. New math. Yeah, I can't do the, I I can't do the point by point breakdown. That's going to take too long. So I'll just do the team total. The team total with 24 points added to 107. 131 is the new total. (laughs) For the Native American I like delegation, that. I like hearing the calculator click there. <laughs> I was like, "Good job." Next up, South Asian delegation, who had 112 points. They too scored 24 points. 136. 136. Exactly. So they are holding on to a slim lead over the Native American delegation. Next up, with one. 37, the Jewish delegation, they put up 17 points this week, 154 total for the Jewish delegation. All right. I mean, there's a, there seems to be a tier system here. <laughs> the Jewish delegation is the bottom of this tier as, as everyone's trying to fight to stay out of the cellar. That's right. Speaking of trying to fight to stay out of the cellar, the Black delegation who was at 165 leading into this week, but they put up a strong week. They put up 42 points. So with that additional 42 points, 207. Next nice. up. Nice. I mean, that that's going to move them a few slots, I bet. Next, it might be. Next up with the Polynesian delegation, who was at 180. And they only put up 21 points this week. Oh, Which means so 201, so they have been leapfrogged by the black delegation. Oh, shout out Randy. Randy's on the Randy, Randy and the crew are on the are on the come up. Which brings us now 
to I think our final four, our final four, starting with the East Southeast delegation who came into the week at 243 points and they put up 30 points. So now they're at 273 points. 273, all right, all right. So Randy saw it, Randy and, and the black delegation definitely saw it in behind them. Next is the white delegation, the white yeah. delegation who was 258 points and they put up a whopping 45 points this week, which now puts them at I do declare. Three hundred and three. Three o three. My math, my math skills did. My math skills failed me there. I was like, "Wait, he said how much?" I realize now that I could have uh, done this data entry a little bit easier, but it's too late now. <laughs> final <laughs> two. This is what we've all been waiting for. The final two the multiracial delegation and the black delegation, I mean, and the Latinx delegation. Do, do will there be a change at the top? Will there be a change at the top? At 335, at 335, the multiracial delegation put up this week 45 points. Which 335, them, 45 points? 380? 380, 380 for the multiracial delegation. And the oh. and the Latinx delegation was at 350, and they put up 35 points, which puts them Whoa. at 385. Whoa. Holding on by the skin of their teeth. So there you have Carlos. it, guys. 385, the Latinx delegation with this with a narrow lead over the multiracial delegation at 380 with 270. Sorry with 303 for the white delegation in third and 273 for the east southeast asian delegation at fourth and there at fifth is the blacks the blacks right in the middle after that we have the jewish delegation at 154 the polynesian delegation at oh sorry no the Polynesian delegation at 201, the Jewish yeah. delegation at 154, and then the South Asian delegation at 136, and the Native American delegation creeping up on the come up with 131. So the battle for first and the battle for, for last, five points separate them. Anything can happen. We still got three, sorry, yet three weeks to go before the champion is crowned in season two. That's what I was just going to say. Three weeks is enough. Three weeks is enough for both, for all of that to change, uh, the bottom and the top. I'm hoping in, in, with the white delegation being about 30 points off of the pace, uh, I'm going to say uh, uh, Colossus uh, mattering <laughs> off the pace that uh, maybe if, if we keep putting up strong weeks like this, we can, we can move our way up to the top. But but we we all I think we all have to give it up for the Latinx and the multiracial delegation for for foreseeing the future and and prog and, and having a hell of a prog uh, prognostic prognostic prognostication prognostic KC <laughs> big words big words are hard sometimes but a, they, as, long they, as, you, as long as you pronounce those syllables out of order and accidentally spit out a slur <laughs> there we go. No, 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 no. We are, we are the clean white delegation. But, uh, but no. I mean, we have to, we have to give credit where credit's due. That, that, that the Latinx and the multiracial delegation have done a fantastic job and have, have basically shared the lead since week one. Yeah, it's been, it's been a two, two delegation battle, and uh, brown people winning again, um, in, in a way. But let's Possibly. get into. Let's get into our nerd news of the week because we had some we had some interesting stories. We didn't have a lot of them, but uh, I would say one of the bigger stories of the week is that we were we found out about a new movie that's been put on the slate. Were you happy about this news, Gordy? Captain America Four 
in the works? I believe we, as we discussed on the Winter Falcon, yet another plug, uh, I don't know. I am excited in the idea of it, but I, I was not as enamored with the uh, production and the execution from uh, the showrunner of the Winter Falcon series that, I, that I'm, I'm completely jacked about, about getting into a movie with the same kind of execution. I'm hoping for a bit of a cleaner story, a less, of a, less problems in the last act than I saw, but I think the groundwork has been, definitely been laid with Fantastic Sam and, oh, that, wow, Fantastic Sam, who's old enough to remember that uh, haircut place. Uh, with, with Sam's fantastic uh, taking of the Captain America mantle and, and everything that has stemmed from it. I, I'm hoping that we're going to get a nice, clean, uh, fun story than, than something bogged down and a little too heavy for its own, uh, for its own bearings. So one thing, I mean, so it's, it's going to be a, two, a two-person writing team with uh, Malcolm Spellman, the showrunner, and um, this person's name, last name, Musum, Dallin Musum, who wrote the uh, critically acclaimed Truth episode, will be the co-writer on the series. Uh, so I, I, what I'm very curious is, is whether they'll have the same level of leeway with regard to exploring Black issues. Uh, you know, one of the things that the show was praised for, even if it had um, its issues, and even though people uh, had their issues with it, one thing that they did praise it almost universally was the extent to which they were willing to quote unquote go there. And, you know, these are the two writers who hadn't been shy about that. So I'm hoping that they don't, you know, take their foot off the gas in that respect. Um, as far yeah, as what, definitely. as far as different storylines, obviously I'm a big fan, big proponent of the Nick Spencer, uh, Sam Wilson run, you know, so I'm hoping that the, more of that, not my cap, um, stuff continues in the movie. And I'm hoping that the gravitas that Sam brought to the role in the in the season finale continues. Um, I hope they bring top tier uh, fight choreography and stunt choreography. So I'm looking forward to it. I understand that there's a potentially some trepidation. I think that there should be a lot less trepidation as if this was announced before we saw um, Winter Falcon. I mean, can you at least? Yeah. You know, I, I, I got to say, I don't think, maybe it's hopeful by me, but I, I hope the, the idea of Sam as Captain America will be met with a lot less uh, quote unquote controversy than either of us maybe will expect. I hope that it's become something that, that even the most ardent uh, racist uh, will, will look at and realize that this is where the story has gone and either shut up or get in, you know, get on the ride. Mm -hmm. I agree. So we, we have, a, a, we have two bits of, uh, I guess I'll call them casting news because we know the actors that have been cast, but we don't know the roles that have been cast for the secret invasion storyline, secret invasion, Disney plus series that, uh, everyone's a scroll as far as, uh, everyone's either Mephisto or a scroll. Um, and, Feeding into this is the fact that Olivia Coleman, who you might know from Netflix is the Queen or from her Oscar um, winning performance in The Favorite, uh, phenomenal actress, is going to be uh, joining the cast of Secret Invasion in an undisclosed role. I'm guessing a scroll. Um, another casting is Amelia Clark, who you might know as Khal Khaleesi in the Game of Thrones television show or in, you know, maybe not so critically acclaimed as Sarah Connor in the much maligned term Terminator Genesis, um, also cast in an undisclosed scroll role. In, uh, Secret I, you know, I wonder, I, I really wonder what the Secret Invasion story is going to be like. I mean, I feel like it's going to definitely be Nick Fury centric, but I, I, feel, I also feel like there's going to be some kind of Marvel sleight of hand where we're not going to get what we're thinking, where everybody's a scroll and that maybe, maybe there'll be some other shape shifting alien race 
or it'll be a sect of scrolls that don't represent all of the scrolls. Not not all scrolls. Hashtag not all scrolls. <laughs> Listen, the the, the, ma- the the MAGA scrolls are going to be the ones <laughs> causing the problem, and you're just your regular scrolls. They just, you know, they don't know what's going on. They just know that Superman is white, and that's all they're worried about. <laughs> right. Maybe the storyline will be it takes place on the Scroll homeworld, and it's actually about a, uh, humans infiltrating the Scroll society. There we go. There we go. I Listen, it also will just feel weird to have a – it, it, it already feels weird to have the Scrolls and not have a Super Scroll with the powers of the Fantastic Four. It just doesn't. It just is something that 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 is feels a little wrong. So I I think that Marvel is going to is going to uh, give us the old trickery and the the sleight of hand here, and the secret invasion will not be what we're all expecting. Mm-hmm. A, well, here's, AKA here's, everyone to scroll. Right. Well, here's an interesting twist. What if secret invasion is how we get super scrolls, and what if that's how we uh, get our Reed Richards that people have been speculating about? In forever i mean it could work it could work but i i think we run into the same thing that we ran into with wandavision that i'm not sure that reed richards is getting debut debuted on disney plus interesting i, I just i just maybe I not just can't see it maybe not that's probably right i mean it, it's it's hard to say because i mean we're getting a movie star at the level of oscar isaac debuting in the mcu as far as we know, uh, in Moon Knight, you know, so true. And, you know, true. And even, and even, even if, even if Mark Spector finds his way into Captain America four or one of the other action, one of the other movies on the slate, we're going to see him, his character get developed on Disney plus. Right. So, I mean, Disney plus may be more important than I'm giving it credit for. I mean, I, d- I definitely agree with you that the kinds of revelations that people had been speculating for Disney Plus series were, you know, a tier above maybe what we should be expecting. But I don't think, you know, I think a, a quick cameo that, you know, I think a quick cameo of a bigger bigger name character, if, if not a big star character, could definitely still on the table for Disney Plus. I thought, I think it was, I think it was a little bit, out of reach for WandaVision because Reed Richards isn't really part of Wanda's story in any appreciable way. So I think it's a lot different from, so even something like Captain America 4, where like we knew, we didn't know Captain America 4 was happening, but Winter Falcon was the way, was the bridge to Captain America 4. And now everyone who was involved is slightly, is slightly more established so that when we see them in Captain America 4, they're going to have more impact, you know? You but, know, um, the, the announcement of Captain America 4 is one of those moments that you remember how great Marvel is at the press release. Oh, they knew sure. exactly, exactly when to drop it. Yeah, well, my sources in the, in the media tell me that Marvel basic, Marvel and Disney basically have their, like, hand around the throat of the media, and they're like you can't say anything until we let you. So it was more of a matter of an email going out that said, uh, all right, guys, you can report your Captain America for now. <laughs> yeah, and then you don't want to get blackballed. You don't want to get uh, left, in, left in the cold when it comes to the mouse, the exactly. house of mouse. Exactly. And as we, as we knew from our Winter Falcon po- podcast, the tentacles of the house of the mouse uh, reach very far, if you know what I'm saying. Um, Damn right <laughs> that dance. That, ha-ha! Oh man, the Mickey the, the Mickey Mouse South Park is still one of my favorite episodes of television I've ever seen. Although I don't think they showed anymore because the mouse does not like being portrayed as a psychopathic murderer. Exactly. So I, so I do have one last little bit of detail about Secret Invasion, which I was not aware of. Uh, that Kyle Bradstreet is writing and executive producing uh, Super Invasion, and you might know his work from Mr. Robot. Right, that's what I was gonna say. Oh, could we get B.D. Wong finally entering the MCU? Ooh, awesome, I'm, I'm here for it. I mean, if I'll take have... B.D. Wong and, Ra- and Rami Malek at any time, any time. 
Yeah, and if we can get if we can put if we can get Mr. Robot vibes in our Secret Invasion, I'm like t- twice as interested in it as as I was before. Now here's a little bit of uh, quirky news, which I'll say. Um, are you are you a fan of the movie Space Jam? Of course, I was. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And for the for the listeners who don't know, I was a teenager in Chicago throughout the '90s. So Space Jam is a is a place deep in my heart, filled with love. Even though I know it's a, a hour and ten minute commercial. Now I will confess to all the listeners, all ten of them, that uh, I have never seen Space Jam. Um, so, oh. uh, so I may have to watch Space Jam in advance of the Space Jam. Is it sequel? Re? Is it is it a remake? I'm not sure, but. No idea. LeBron Space Jam versus Jordan Space Jam. Right. It's like the Zack Snyder's Justice League of Space Jam. Um, but <laughs> Marvel's answer to Space Jam is that they're doing a superhero uh, NBA crossover during a, an upcoming NBA game where the, I believe it's the Golden State Warriors will be playing against the Pelicans. And Marvel characters will be appearing during the game. Uh, There will be an in-game storyline featuring members of the Avengers while the game is going on. So we'll have 3D virtual characters, including Iron Man, Black Panther, Captain Marvel, Captain America, Black Widow, and Doctor Strange with uh, these graphics happening. It's going to be called Arena of Heroes, and it will air on ESPN2, ESPN Deportes, and stream on ESPN+. Are you are you stoked to watch a basketball game where there's apparently a superhero storyline happening around it? No. <laughs> Listen, I I can I consider myself and Bill Simmons like two of the last seventeen to nineteen white uh, diehard NBA fans left in America, and I I don't I want to watch Steph Cook. I don't want to watch. I don't want to watch Doctor Strange and an overlay while Steph is dropping another 40 points and Zion Williamson is redefining what the center position is. No, thank you. No, thank you. But that is, that is my critical eye at it. There isn't a chance on this earth that I will miss that game and whatever <laughs> ridiculousness will come from it. Well, that game will be taking place on May 3rd. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when our podcast is uh, in proximity to that. Uh, oh, that's on a Monday night. So our podcast will be happening on the second and this will happen on the third. So we'll be able to report, uh, hopefully, about what happens when Marvel and the NBA clash. And uh, yeah, who knows? I, I, Maybe- I can't even... I can't even come up with jokey ideas of what that might be. Are they going, uh, are basically, is, is Dr. Strange going to be in trouble with a bookie and calling the other Avengers to be like, hey, we need to point shave, bro? No, he's going to go through all of the different scenarios in which the Pelicans uh, <laughs> defeat Golden State. He's, you know. Yeah, he's going to look at 8 million different games and see that <laughs> Steph didn't cook in three of them and figure out how to get the, how to get the uh, Pelicans to buy in the Stan Van Gundy's defensive uh, system. Like, uh, sorry, we got a little. Uh, up, we can get a little deep on the NBA talk here. <laughs> he puts on puts up one finger. This is it. This is your moment, Stan. Make your substitution now. I I just want to hear Doctor Strange scream ice at a bunch of NBA players, much like Tom Thibodeau. <laughs> well, actually, like now I just went down a rabbit hole. If you could pick any of these characters to coach an NBA game. Iron Man, Black Panther, Captain Marvel, Captain America, Black Widow, and Doctor Strange. Who would you want coaching your favorite team? I mean, it. I mean, uh, uh, racial questions aside, it's got to be Black Panther, right? I mean, it's got to be Black Panther or Cap. <laughs> they are the strategists. But Cap will give the great inspirational speech. I mean, listen, Cap's team. Cap's team will take a lot of like a lot of layups jumping off the right foot and making sure that everything is done smoothly. And yes, and they'll have that fire speech at halftime. But I feel like, but I definitely feel like T'Challa's team 
would understand, you know, the back cut and the uh, and how and how to get open for three and run a, and run a rather sophisticated offense. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I mean, like we would we would we would be not we would be remiss if we didn't get into uh, our little bit of like low grade sexism of having a Captain Marvel coach against Black Widow. Um, but uh, yeah, Iron Man. Hey, I think look, look. Iron Man would I think would be interesting uh, coach. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I see Tony. I don't know if I see if I see uh, Tony Stark watching many sports. Uh, he seems like that guy who 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 calls everything sports ball and thinks he's way too hipster for it. Uh, more than Doctor Strange. I mean, I mean, listen, Doctor Strange is a whole different animal. I think I think Doctor Strange is the one with the gambling problem. I'm I'm gonna <laughs> stick with that. And and I I, I think Doctor Strange is gonna be, 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 be would be betting against his own team. And then and, and running a little point shaving, uh, point shaving scheme. Like all of a sudden, Steph's not playing about eight minutes of the third quarter, and everyone wonders why. And Doctor Strange is just sitting there going, "Nope, nope, it's, it's Draymond time. It's load, nope, it's load management. We, we, it's load management. Yeah. We're just, uh, yeah. I feel you. Well, and, and, we'll let, we'll leave that up to the listeners. Of those characters, who would you like to see coaching your favorite NBA team? I, I, yeah, for me, it's, it's. I definitely want T'Challa coaching my Knicks. Um, but you know, I just think that they, they would respond very positively to, to Wakanda leadership, but let's get into another story. This is less of a story and more of like a riff, I guess. Uh, are you a fan of Dave Batista? Of course. I, I did the, uh, I did the Dave Batista guns at WrestleMania in, uh, in New York, watched his last match and enjoyed every moment of it. Well, Dave Batista has stated his intention <laughs> to play Bane in the uh, DC Films universe, and I know that I know that started a little bit of controversy in our group because I guess technically it would be a bit of a racial draft of a, a race bend of there being a Filipino yeah. Bane, but uh, yes, uh, I what, what, I love I love Dave's audacity. Because from what I read, and this some of this is from me being a professional wrestling nerd, but some of the some of the stories coming out was that Dave Dave set up the meeting and told them he'd like to play Bane, and they went, "Dave, it's nice to meet you." Essentially, <laughs> uh, and and we're like, "Oh, okay." And and the the meeting was not uh, at DC's behest. That this is this is Dave right. pushing it, which I, I... which to me is fantastic. Yeah, I, I love the audacity as well. I love the fact that Dave is like, look, I heard that Mahersha Ali went to Marvel and said, I want to play Blade. They didn't even have a Blade movie on the docket. And they were like, hmm, let's get a Blade movie on the docket so that we can get Mahersha Ali in the MCU. I think that, you know, obvi- aside from all the different controversies around people's opinions of either the Snyder Cut or what's on the slate for DC. I think that it would be a bit of a boon for their film universe to get an, a, a well-regarded um, both actor, quote unquote, but with a huge fan base and, and an engaged social media fan base in this iconic role. And, and I honestly, I, I mean, we've talked to a lot of uh, Latino fans and Latinx fans, like they're not necessarily upset at the idea of, of Bane being played by Dave Batista. So, I mean, it, it's not like Bane being, we've talked about this. It's not like Bane being white was such a problem in the Nolan universe. I, it wasn't a story that I heard much of. Yeah. So I, mean, I don't think I, we talked about it after the fact, but at the time that the casting went through, I don't remember it being majorly controversial. It just shows how hot Nolan was. He could do no wrong at that point. But, yeah. uh, but I, I, I appreciate it because I think it's great for DC to grab a recognizable Marvel star and character and, and have the actor come over, which, you know, is, is always a good get for them. And this means that Bane probably won't die in whatever movie <laughs> he's going to lose the Batman in. Well, also from a merchandising standpoint, 
Batista's a professional wrestler, which means he could show up in a WWE, sh- um, uh, one of their shows as Bane wearing the Bane, or, you know, maybe not as Bane, as Dave Batista, but wearing the Bane mask that they could therefore sell on WWE.com and in some sort of like co-promotional thing. I can give you as as a pro wrestler, I can give you a look into Dave and his wonderful, beautiful character that professional wrestling fans a lot of uh, that uh, on the whole are not a fan of. But uh, Dave came back to his last run, his his retirement run, uh, where he was going to have a match, uh, the aforementioned WrestleMania match with uh, with Triple H, which some people may know from the uh, the Third Blade movie, which <laughs> should be stricken from the consciousness. But, I mean, uh, but at Dave, this point, isn't he like the head of creative for WWE, though? Yeah, w, he is. Uh, he's the next in line to run it when Vince McMahon finally shuttles off this mortal coil. But uh, but yeah, Triple H is, is is a major head honcho there. He's head of uh, creative for NXT. He's part of the head creative team for Raw and SmackDown. He's he does a lot, and he's actually uh, there's a lot of hope in the future for Triple H running things, but. Dave came back as, as the Triple H and, and Batista characters had, had been intertwined through basically Dave's entire career. He mm-hmm. came back to Raw with a fake uh, nose ring that what? he wore only he, – he no one knew it was fake. He wore it only to Raw for the six weeks leading up to WrestleMania where he wore a nose ring every week. Then during their no-holds-barred New York street fight at WrestleMania – uh, Triple H pulled the nose ring off, quote unquote, with a pair of pliers, and Dave sold it with uh, some wonderful fake blood and screams. nice, nice. So, so this he's this willing is the kind of to go go with yeah. that level of dedication. Yeah, Dave. Love- Dave is Dave is a, is a beautiful unicorn of a man whom I love more than most men on this earth. Mm-hmm. I am wildly excited for this. So on a scale of one to 10, Dave Batista as Bane, you're giving that an 11 or 15? I mean, okay, I have to admit that I don't know if I see the comedy stylings of Dave Batista as Bane, but I'm definitely in. I will, I, I don't know if I'm going to give, I don't know if I want to give it more than an eight because I'm a little scared that because Bane should not be anywhere near as funny as Drax the Destroyer has been. <laughs> but but going into going into the, the 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 original Guardians of the Galaxy movie, no one really thought of Drax as a comedic character. Right. That's an entire. I mean, that that's something that was changed by the, by uh, James Gunn and Dave Batista in those movies. So I could see it. And if Batista's coming, maybe James Gunn is staying. Maybe Batista's able to be. Maybe he is going to carry a Marvel character and a DC character at the same time. Oh, I just thought about that. So Secret Six, right? Blade, I mean, Blade. Bane, like, plays a pretty big role in Secret Six, right? Yes. Yeah. You I know, mean, that so could be the storyline. Yeah, so, so Gunn could transition from Suicide Squad to Secret Six. And, you know, maybe that's how we, maybe that's how we get Batista as Bane, as, as a, you know, as a lead character there. Which would be weird because they are both slated to work on Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Right. In you between, know. you know, whatever movie properties. So, th- I mean, this could be this could be interesting, and it could be fun. It could be, you know, a bit of a, a bit of tongue in cheek from both from both sides, as as we've seen, you know, we've seen Josh Brolin between the X Men universe, the former X Men universe, mm-hmm. and the uh, and the DC universe. Maybe maybe we're gonna get something here. I mean, Russell Crowe was recently cast in Thor uh, Thor Four. Which right. I believe Thor, Love and War. Thor, no, Thor, Love and Th- uh, Love and Thunder. Love and Thunder. There we go. Yeah, Love yeah. and Thunder. I mean, Ru- Russell Crowe is making the the. Making I gotta the say though, I gotta say, Love and War, like Thor, Four, Love of War, like Thor, Four, Love and War, actually has a much nicer ring to it than uh, Love and Thunder. But you know, nice. Yeah, I don't. Know, I, mm-hmm. I don't know if they're gonna put the number in the tagline. To be hundred percent honest, I don't think Ragnarok had a number. No, it definitely didn't. But yeah. Marvel actually has been, I don't think they've done, other than Iron Man 2, they haven't numbered any of their sequels, have they? 
Oh, uh, no, I don't think so. Was uh, No, no, they all get taglines. I was going to say Hitman, but no, I, I, I think, yeah, it's always with the subtitles instead of the, instead of the numeric, uh, instead of the numeric uh, chronological order, which, which sort of makes sense as I don't think they want to alienate the new viewers. Right. You know, if you see that Thor, if you see Thor Ragnarok is Thor three, you may feel that you need to watch Thor and Thor two, which you definitely didn't need to do right. to enjoy right. Thor, to enjoy Ragnarok. And I wonder if there's some some kind of like superstition involved, where like if you put a number on it, it it suggests to people that it's that there may have been like too many of these movies. Whereas if you just call it call it what it is, like you said, new audiences will just show up for it like they'll know vaguely that it's a sequel but they won't necessarily know that it's the fifth movie i think mission impossible kind of did the same thing where they they stopped numbering their movies and they were just like mission impossible uh ghost protocol or rogue nation or you know tom cruise runs for 15 straight minutes you know amen and i love that the fast and the furious did not do that and they're telling (laughs) they're they're working the number into the title Fate right. of the Furious. <laughs> right. It's like FX. <laughs> yeah. Fast Nine, Fast Ten. I'm very excited for Fast Nine. I the, the, that will be our uh that's going to be the 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 hope of the summer for me. Yeah, we might have to do a special podcast for uh for Fast Nine for sure. Um but speaking of sequels, Into the Spider-Verse 2 has named its directors. And in, whereas I think they had two directors in the first one, oh, no, they had three directors in the first one, uh, Bob Parachetti, Peter Ramsey, Rodney Rothman, and it won an Oscar for Best Animated Feature in 2018. This group has Joaquin Dos Santos, Kent Powers, who was nominated for One Night in Miami, and Justin Thompson. So they went from you know, one set of three directors to another set of three directors. Um, these are all names that I'm somewhat familiar with, but, um, you know, I don't have a lot of attachment to them. I do think it's interesting that they didn't bring any of the original directors uh, back for the for the new movie, but, you know, the producers are still involved. I'm sure that whatever animation technology they were using um, is still involved. I don't know about the writers, it's not supposed to come out until 2022. So we have a lot of time to get into our Into the Spider-Verse 2 talk. But do you have any thoughts about the sequel? I mean, Into the Spider-Verse, Spider-Verse, the OG, Spider-Verse 1, as I guess it'll be called now, it's such a great movie. I mean, they're... For sure. It might, it might be my favorite superhero movie. I'm not sure. I haven't... I haven't uh, codified by rankings there but man that is a beautiful story and a yeah. and just so wonderfully wonderfully uh drawn or or animated as as it were yeah for me I, you know what's fun oh sorry go, oh, ahead. go ahead please no i was no, just gonna no, say go that ahead. i'm a i'm a huge spider-man fan and as much as i love mcu spidey into the spider-verse is by far my favorite spider-man movie um it's hard to you know Obviously, rating an animated movie against a live action movie is fraught with a whole bunch of different pitfalls. But, you know, just, you know, keeping it very restricted in the vein of what you want out of a Spider-Man story, it's going to be hard to top. I'm hoping that uh, Spider-Man 2099, Miguel O'Hara, plays a bigger role in it. I'm hoping that we get a little bit of silk in that. I think it would be pretty cool if they found a way to incorporate uh, animated versions of our live action, uh, live action Spideys from the different um, movie incarnations into it, but maybe I'm just aiming too high for that. But go on. I'm I'm hope I'm hoping we get '90s uh, Marvel comics television uh, cartoon <laughs> Spider Man in the one that wasn't allowed to throw any punches and everything <laughs> had to sort of uh, everything had to sort of end with 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 villains stumbling into things. I want I want that Spider Man to uh, to be included, but I mean it's great. I the idea of the Spider Verse and all the different incarnations of Spider Man and and the wackiness that that ensues with Spider Man across all of the multiverse is is fantastic. I'm I'm definitely in. 
And speaking of Spider-Man, I guess that's a natural transition into what has to be the biggest story of the week, which is that Disney and Sony reached a massive, some estimated in the $3 billion range deal for the second pay window for Sony Pictures movies to end up on Disney platforms, including Hulu, ABC, Disney Plus, AB, uh, FX. So, I mean, a few weeks ago, we talked about how Sony had a deal with Netflix for pay one window, which happens essentially, you know, a couple months after the movie is is in the theaters. There was also a little bit of, of, of play with regard to uh, original Netflix series um, on, so, you know, that were related to Sony. But this is by far um, a bigger deal because it involves the entirety of the Sony library and it involves the extended range of, of where these movies will end up. And of course they do because, because the Netflix deal doesn't kick in until 2022. The first three Spider-Man movies will likely end up on Disney plus rather than on Netflix which kind of brings the whole like homecoming, uh, far from home, no way home, will find a home on Disney Plus. And that's cool as a Marvel fan. Right. I mean, I, you know, I wonder too, if this is going to open, I mean, clearly I, I, I would think this is going to open up some of those non-Spider-Man, Spider-Man world Sony properties to maybe be uh, as accepted in the MCU. Maybe not directly, you know, it'll be a little offshoot. I'm sure most of them will happen on the West Coast and maybe nothing in the MCU will actually happen in San Francisco as as we all know that that is the Venom homeland now. Oh, but hey, we just got a Shang-Chi trailer that takes place in San Francisco. So, I mean, oh, Ant-Man, right. Ant-Man's in San Francisco, Shang-Chi's in San Francisco. So, I mean, it's, it's not it's not completely uncharted territory. That's right. I did forget about Ant-Man. Uh, yeah, I I wonder, because I really, it's one of the, the tragic, uh, God, that's a horrible thing to say, but I'm just going to run with it. It's one of the tragic things that happened with this year pandemic that uh, <laughs> we didn't get to see. We didn't, we didn't get to see Mobius and figure out exactly how all of this was going to work. But, I mean, yeah, it's one of the interesting things that, that is coming out of that Mobius movie that I admit, as even a Spider-Man fan, I'm not 100% sure that I'm going to be wildly excited to see. But I am definitely excited to see what the, uh, what the world will look like and how it will relate to our, our J. Jonah Jameson Spider-Man world that uh that resides in the mcu yeah i'm trying to remember i always forget which one is happening this year between morbius and venom 2 um and i believe venom 2 is first oh so venom 2 is happening in 2021 and morbius is happening in 2022 right right but i i I don't remember if that's how it was originally scheduled i think it was originally scheduled that that morbius and more I thought it was Mobius. Morbius was uh that Morbius was scheduled first, and Venom Two was supposed to come later. But then yes. that pesky pandemic got in the way. Yeah, it was all the bats. It was the vampire bats. You know, they they wanted more money, and they were like, "Listen, we're not going to do okay. You don't want to pay us? We'll just start a pandemic, and you know, and then we'll we'll figure it out." So yeah, so Venom Two is happening uh, according as of now, September twenty fourth, twenty twenty one. Venom let there be carnage so we'll see whether there are easter eggs in that that somehow connect it to the MCU because you know everybody loves a reshoot so they can always do some kind of reshoot that that makes it makes us know that they are somewhat set in the universe um yeah no this is I think I think I think we're all excited for for Woody Harrelson to get to ham it up as a uh, comic book character so that is going to be an exciting movie yeah for sure um i feel a lot more positive now that uh sony and and D- and disney have signed this deal that they'll find a way to make the spider-man relationship work um including the eventual and hopeful 
introduction of Miles Morales into the MCU proper? Like, no, even yeah, though... Think... No, go ahead. I think, I, I was going to say, I think the only loser really here is uh, is me and the, the, the Microsoft Xbox fans, because we are not going to be getting... We are not going to be getting any Marvel video games uh, the rest of the way here if, if since Marvel and Sony are so intertwined now. No, no, probably not. Um, yeah, you might want to get yourself a PlayStation. So you've never even played a minute of the Marvel of the Miles Morales game, I, I guess. No, no, I'm I'm still on an Xbox One. I'm waiting for uh, a a little bit of the uh, the 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 excitement to die down. I'm not I'm not into fighting people for a system quite yet. But uh, but eventually, I think I may have to I may have to just PS Five it with this one. I've been a I've been an Xboxer since uh, since the 360, and and I'm not sure I want to. I'm not sure what to do now. Actually, before the 360, the OG Xbox. But some of these Marvel games, I really want to play Miles Morales. I actually have been thinking about just buying a PS4 to play the OG Spider-Man game, and I think the Miles Morales version is available on PS4. It's just not as comprehensive. But uh, either way, uh, I mean, the, as, as you were saying, this. Sony and, and, and Marvel being on the same page and, and getting everything hashed out and us being able to be confident that we're going to continue to get Spider-Man in the MCU is really nothing but good. Yeah, and I just for everyone at all. I just thought about that. Like, listen, I don't have any kids and I, I may never have kids, but like into the Spider-Verse on Disney Plus is like natural fit. That is Yeah, I mean it, 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 it'll always hold up yeah so so the fact that they have the ability to get that movie on there in perpetuity is huge for the family audience and huge for the type of you know diverse audience that we that clearly disney is trying to cultivate so i feel as a spider-man fan i feel really good about the continuing relationship between those two companies and I'm looking forward to seeing what the future holds. Netflix, like I said, you know, the metaphor that I that I continue to go back to is is the Netflix feels like the guy you um, go on a date with and then put your pictures on Instagram in order for the guy you really want to hit you up on the DMs and be like, all right, let's get serious because I I'm, I'm I don't want to see you hooking up with some other dude. You know, Netflix was was that other dude. And you know what? Netflix has rebounded pretty well. I mean, they they can continue with the they can continue. I mean, one they're making money hand over fist, but they can continue with the Umbrella Academy and Lock and Key and a lot of the more obscure mm -hmm. uh, comics titles that maybe need a big platform like Netflix. I yeah. think that's the right role for them anyway. Instead of instead of carrying the water of Disney and Marvel. Yeah, and to that end, I'm actually surprised that Netflix didn't make a bigger play for the Valiant universe. You know, um, you know, if maybe if they had signed some kind of deal for Bloodshot and then decided that they wanted to expand out that that universe with uh, with the other Valiant characters, what are their names again? I don't know. It 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 doesn't really matter. But <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually I'm actually a huge Valiant fan. And man, I was excited for Bloodshot the movie. And then they cast Vin Diesel. And then I tried to lie to myself the rest of the time it was shooting. And that was a that movie was not good. No, uh, no. But yeah, I would. There, there, there's a lot of fun to be had in the Valiant universe. You know, Archer and Archer and Armstrong weekly series would be fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. Exo Man of War. There's, I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of great untapped characters. The ninetyness of Ninjak, um, Faith. If you're not if you're not familiar, Faith is a fantastic uh, character that is uh, a full figured woman, and her sort of plight through not being the superhero that everyone thinks a woman should be. There's a, there there would be a lot there, and I'm also a little surprised that Netflix has not made it a. Uh, a way for them to continue their Q rating in the nerd, in the nerd uh, hemispheres with, with signing up with the Valiant universe. But time will tell, maybe things will change. I mean, yeah, for right I mean, now they've got Thunder Force. Wait, is Thunder Force tied into a comic book universe? No, I just was, I just oh, know okay. it's a superhero <laughs> that I haven't seen. 
Right. And then they have that Jupiter rising, which is more Millar world. Right. Um, right. But yeah, to me, Netflix should really look deep into trying to acquire. I, I can't, you know what? I need to look this up right now because someone bought the rights to the Valiant um, films out from under Sony. Um, and I want to say it might have been Paramount. But I, I thought it was, I honestly thought it was Universal. But I, I'm not I'm not sure of that. And I don't have the ability right now to Google it in the background. But I do have the ability and the talent to just keep talking about stuff while you're <laughs> doing research and figuring that out. Oh, man, I can just bask in the glow of uh, in case it has, been, it has not been mentioned. But remember, the white delegation won the scoring this week. And that is another week in the books for us. With our fantastic drafting of, of characters like Darkhawk in his massive week last week, and Superman and Superboy carrying the weight while Wonder Woman falters. So interestingly, there's a company called DMG Entertainment, and they have the rights to to these movies. So they did they had this deal for Bloodshot, but after the bloodshot thing fell through, I'm trying to see what their future projects are because it looks like, yeah, it looks like Sony divested themselves of, yeah, so DMG still has, yeah, so DMG has the rights right now. So hopefully Netflix reaches out to DMG and says, yeah, we'd like to bring the other, oh, look, Paramount. Might be Paramount. Ah. Yeah. All right. Well, now's as good a time as any with all our news knocked off to transition into the supplemental draft. Are you ready for the supplemental draft for this week? I mean, it has been fun. We don't have we don't have the uh, the controversy that we had last week, but the supplemental draft has been fun sort of weeding out some of the minor characters that don't get as much of a spotlight as they should. And this week was no different. I agree. And uh, it's a shame that we don't have Kia here this week because I uh, specifically was hoping that I could get Kia's thirst levels for the leading off pick from the South Asian delegation. Did you get a chance to look up this uh, fan cast? Uh, Vidjit Jamwal? I did not but I assume that he is a beautiful man. Uh, he is a beautiful man. Um, and he is playing for the East, I'm sorry, for the South Asian delegation in the role of Clay Quartermain, the noted shield agent and heartthrob. Uh, Viji Jamwa, by all means, uh, check it out later. And uh, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen in case you get a chance to look down at, at a, this uh, very attractive man that is, I believe, 40 years old, but which, again, puts us all to shame. All to shame. And Clay Quartermain is a, such a great character that is definitely underused, I think, in Marvel. Uh, but I, I would love to see a bigger, uh, a bigger and more prominent use of him in the MCU. I think he would be fun. I think he would make a lot of sense. Oh, and the fan cast is of uh, essentially what, what Jack Sparrow should look like. <laughs> I mean, th that, is a, that is a hunk of a man. I'm not sure that he should be wasted in a non-superhero uh, role. Fair enough. I mean, you know, there's no rule that says in subsequent seasons of the racial draft, we can't recycle some of our fan casts. So, you know, keep that in mind. But, you know, for the purpose of uh, this particular uh, round, this is uh, this is our vid. I, I urge all the listeners to Google Viju and uh, Viju Jamwal and uh, bask, in, bask in his glory. But yeah, that is a uh, that is Clay Quartermain. The leadoff pick. I am going to going to go ahead and read from the wiki. Wiki, wiki, wiki. All right. 
Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., close friend of Nick Fury, and a major player in Battles with the Hulk, Clay Quatermain spent his early adulthood seeking adventure wherever he could find it. He became a decorated Air Force officer, a battle-ready bodyguard, and mastered a, a wide variety of weapons. He was then recruited by S.H.I.E.L.D., where he went into espionage training. Clay became one of Nick Fury's favorite agents when he distinguished himself in action against AIM and against Dr. Doom's Yellow Claw Android. Clay became noted for his optimism and enthusiasm in combat, and he proved exceptional in the field as well as administration and training. What do you think that I the mean, people thought about this? Uh, well, actually, you know, give me your opinion, and then I'll let you know what the people thought. Listen, my opinion is different here than it is in my Twitter persona. Uh, but here, I like it. I think that, like I said earlier, I think Clay Quater, Clay Quartermain would be a fantastic addition to the MCU and give us a little less of the the pencil-pushing uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. agent type and more of the daring, what we want Jimmy Woo to be agent mm -hmm. type. Exactly. I agree. So, um, unfortunately, the people disappointed us this week as they gave him only a 50% approval rating, including 33.3% strongly approved, 16.7% somewhat approved, 16.7% somewhat, somewhat disapproved, and 33.3% racist. Wow, but, that's surprising. Yeah, apparently there's, apparently there's a quarter main hive and there are uh, white people who are just like, we no. We will not allow uh, Clay Quartermain to uh, be race bent. Who knew? I, I believe it's like the I believe it's like the Quartermain cave. Would that work <laughs> better than Hive? Hard to say. Um, yeah, that that that's really surprising. Next up is the Jewish delegation, and they, you know, I mean, we we have our our thoughts about how the Jewish delegation uh, conducts its uh, draft strategy. Uh, they selected a character named Ulysses Solomon Archer and a fan cast of Zac Efron. Do you have any thoughts about Ulysses Solomon Archer? Listen, I like to keep it real here. I, I sometimes I can I can I can talk about Clay Quartermain and be <laughs> and, and, and have a deep conversation. I have no idea who that is. I, I don't lie about my comic uh, street cred. So I, I definitely right. remember seeing him in She-Hulk comics. He's basically a trucker, you know, who um, got recruited to do trucking in space. And that's pretty much Oh, it. oh okay, okay. I, I, I remember this. this. This is from the sensational She-Hulk run. Mm -hmm, yeah. Which, which hopefully will be the basis of the uh, Tatiana Masnally show that's coming out in 2022, I believe. Yeah, I believe so. On Disney Plus. Yeah, I, that, that is a fantastic series, but that is a deep cut from somebody who even loves that mm -hmm. series that I did not remember the name. Yeah, so that's a deep cut. Um, as, as, according to the wiki, 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 crime fighter, trucker, and starship pilot. Uh, U U.S. and his older brother Jefferson are the sons of a pair of truck drivers. U.S. idolized his older brother and thought him thought he let him win all the time to make him feel good. However, Jefferson was too humili yeah, humiliated to admit that his little brother was better at everything. Even as a child, U.S. wanted to be a truck driver, but his parents insisted on him getting a good education. And there's a whole bunch of other paragraphs, but the important thing is that he became a truck driver, and he's still a truck driver out in space. Um, Traditionally, he's depicted as kind of like a blonde haired, blue eyed guy with a headband. But, you know, I think that the fan cast, honestly, of Zach Afron, even though he's not blonde, he's there are many pictures of him with a headband. And I think it's a good look, honestly. Yeah, Zach, Zach Efron, comic book space trucker, works for me. Yeah. I just want, I mean, normally I expect him having sort of like a Southern accent. So that's the only weird thing with the Zac Efron fan cast, but you know, he can make it work, I'm sure. But what did the people think is the important question. Uh-oh. The people gave him a 66.7% approval rating. 
in, well, yeah, 66.7 rounded. So, because these the numbers are not going to quite add up. 25% right, of strongly approve, 41.7% somewhat approve, 16.7% somewhat disapprove, and 16.7% anti-Semitic. It's really a shame that, uh, you know, they, they just can't imagine a Jewish uh, truck driver. That, that's that's how I see it. So, wow. Uh, well, yeah, I I have to admit, I, I, I didn't look at it that way, but I see it now. That's a, that's a problem. <laughs> oh man, I you know it would be a, it would be like Zac Efron in the MCU in a in a comedic character would be a fun would be a fun thing for all of us to see you know because I I enjoyed the Neighbors movies and I I actually enjoyed the Baywatch movie as I am as, as a wrestling fan obligated to see everything The Rock ever does. Now, for me, if I was going to cast Zac Efron in a role, I think I would cast him as like Star Fox. You know, I mean, yes, yes. Problematic, you know, I, I could definitely... problematic elements aside, like you know, like him as like a pretty boy with somewhat comedic elements. You know, I I feel like that would be just like a great place for him. Yeah, I, I, if I were if I could put Zac Efron anywhere, though, I would say Kite Man. DC. <laughs> hell yeah hell yeah like i could i could see it and exactly hell yeah it would be great because kite man is awesome all right so that brings us to the white delegation gordy i'm gonna go oh, ahead and let, yeah i'm gonna go ahead and let the people know what the pick is first and then i'm gonna let you explain it uh <laughs> the white delegation who you might short. know as uh as as a uh, noted fridge fridge aficionados and uh <laughs> they they selected sue dibney wife of elongated man ralph dibney and the fan cast was joanna newsom go ahead so listen i have i have made no bones about this But oops, sorry. Had a moment of 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 lost you there. Uh, I've made no bones about this, and part of what I definitely moved to do is to highlight all of the female characters that have been murdered for male characters' continued plot development. Uh, and Sue Dibney is one of the shining examples of this well, she wasn't just, practice. She was just murdered, if we're being honest. <laughs> We were, I, I was, I was getting there. Um, and if I were a more evil person, I may have, I may have drafted Doctor White oh. and then really went in. Uh, oh, yeah, no. exactly. It's, that's gross. Uh, yes. If anyone, wait, wait, Doctor, Doctor White, Light. Sorry. Nice. <laughs> just, just, do, just Doctor White. That's all. We just mix it. We just mix it in. Uh, but yeah, if, if anyone listening is not uh, is not familiar with the identity crisis story from DC, uh, count yourself lucky because that is not a great story. It is not a shiny moment of DC putting its superheroes in the best light. Um, and and in, a, in a quick synopsis, uh, Doctor Light breaks into the uh, moon base of the Justice League. Uh, finds no one there as he's trying to steal back his weaponry and decides, hey, the elongated life, uh, excuse me, the elongated man's wife is here. Let me get to some raping. Which that is, that is an amazing, that is an amazing twist where someone is like, I'm here to <laughs> steal technology, but while I'm here, might as well become I a mean, sexual offender. When in Rome? I don't know. I don't know. No, I, 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 I mean that that is that is a weird flex in every sense of the word. It is a, it is a story that makes very little sense. And then the story continues, and and it, for those that are familiar familiar know the story then focuses around Batman and the fact that the that uh, Zatanna and a few of the other uh, members of the Justice League took some memories away from Batman 
when they took the memories of Dr. Light, uh, excuse me, took the memories of the rape away from Dr. Light and tried wait, to quick, rehab Wait, quick him. question. Did they take the memories of the rape away from Sue Dibney? In the storyline, I do not believe that to be so. That's which, that's like even more fucked up. I mean, at least if you like <laughs> erase the, like, I'm not saying that you erase accountability for Dr. Light, but like from a trauma perspective, like, wouldn't it be like a nicer thing to do to say like, you were victimized in a horrific way. Let's go ahead and like take that away, but we're just gonna go ahead and kill Dr. Light, you know, or, or do something horrible to him. But and then you yeah, know, I, I don't know. It's, 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 it's crazy. What year did this storyline come out, Gordy? 2000 and I want to say it's 2006, but I'm sure that you will give me the exact year. But yeah, it is, it is one of the baffling and more like almost malicious uh, storylines in DC history. Uh, and, and as, as, as the white delegation has done, we, we highlighted uh, uh, Alexander DeWitt. We highlighted Marcus Amortis. So we had to highlight the most, polarizing and you know i'm not one to say that that rape storylines should not happen rape is sadly a thing that happens in the world and our media and our superheroes should have to deal with not have to deal with it but should have moments where they're confronted with it i'm not against that but it also needs to be handled in a much more dignified way than this particular in, uh, that, uh, than identity crisis handled it so it looks in like it looks like the of, story it looks like the story came out in two thousand four, but it was collected in two thousand six. Um, got but, it. Got it. Got it. That's probably yeah. where I read it. I, yeah. I I am one for the trade paperback. Yeah, I just think in general, comic book spaces are probably not the best places to really explore the nuances of of a sexual assault storyline, because no matter how you slice it the the conventions of the comic book medium can't get into all of the all of the aspects of of what the ramifications of it are you know right right it's it should sort of be a third rail for any comic book story and and if it if there is a story that that uh, an artist or and a writer whom i also can you know i can our artist writing sure. all that fun stuff if, if the people involved in making a comic book decide to touch that third rail, it definitely needs to be handled with more dignity than Identity Crisis did. And DC knew it with, I, I would bet there's a reason that it took two years for that to be uh, collected into a, a, a paperback because I believe DC knew as it was coming out uh, that this was not the story to go. Um, and the, uh, the long run in the story was that Sue was actually murdered in the same story by dr light's uh, wife by dr light's wife and yes and <laughs> and there's a lot it, there is a lot it is a real rough story it is not the kind of story that we want to talk about and joke about here but it is something that that i actually wrestled with with making this choice because this is one of those stories where i read it and i went you know i'm not gonna read any superheroes for a bit after this i think it's time for me to take a break it happened to me at wrestling after booker t lost uh to triple h at wrestlemania 19 and, and triple h has spent the entire time saying that people that look like booker t can't be were, champion because they were uppity i believe uh, i believe he right. pretty much and alluded there, to the with, fact that <laughs> and, and actually said that people with nappy hair like booker t the direct quote uh <laughs> same thing it's the same thing in professional wrestling a storyline about race that that goes like that is uh, to me it's okay to be to be told if we if the good guy wins if the racist doesn't win at the end and in that particular wwe storyline triple h won at the end yes so he did he was, and he and he i think he won right. with it i think he won with his finisher he didn't even win through like yeah, nefarious means like i think he won oh, like no. legitimately yeah, he did not cheat the win. Triple H won clean in the middle of, of the ring at WrestleMania 
as one of the very few heels to ever finish a WrestleMania that he started it to defend his title at, at, uh, at a WrestleMania. Because normally you want to send the people home happy. Right. Uh, this, is, this is one of those storylines that it was really, really bothered me before I had the word Uh-oh. as well as I do now. Mm-hmm. Uh, about about the problems with uh with with the characterization of of, of a sexual assault like this, um but yeah th- this this is a dark time in DC and this is not something that you will see twenty years later there being a sequel to with new characters and this will be something that is shunted into DC's dark and sordid past even though it's only uh, I believe seventeen years old uh, from the two thousand and four date right. Well, you know, as the white delegation, I appreciate the fact that you're using your role to highlight these uh, mis- mischaracterizations and these, you know, miscarriages of justice. But it's a hard transition to make, but we're going to move on <laughs> in the interest of hilarity. Yeah. So the people. Sadly, I can't just, I, I can't just pick clan members mm-hmm. and then keep doing that every week. Mm-hmm. So the people had a take. And I will respect the people's take in that they gave it a 66, sorry, a 67.2% approval rating, including 42.9% strongly approve, 14.3% somewhat approve, 14.3% somewhat disapprove, and 28.6% strongly disapprove, which... I don't, yeah, I'm not sure how to ca- characterize that. Is that people who are like saying that, you know, Sue Dibney shouldn't be white or is it just basically saying that she, she shouldn't have been drafted at all? It's hard to say, but. Yeah, I think Sue did. I, I, I voted strongly disapproved for my own pick because Sue Dibney <laughs> should, I mean, it's just one of those things that I felt, I felt, the, the, like I said earlier, I felt like I had to touch, but man, it's just such a bad story and no redeeming value. I feel that. So that brings us to the Native American delegation, which, you know, I mean, peeking back the curtain, I I sometimes help out with the Native American delegation. And this one was uh, Mercy Graves, who you might know as uh, Lex Luthor's bodyguard, uh, Amazon. And there was a fan casting. Are you familiar with the actress Julia Jones? Right, yes. Fantastic. Yes. So Julia I Jones. Think, I, think, I, think she, I think she would fit in perfectly with Native American Lex Luthor. Yes, that's the other thing. Native American Lex Luthor, Native American Mercy Graves. You know, there's a little bit of kinship there. So I'll go with ahead. My, and... with, my white, with my white super family of Crypto, yeah. Superboy, and Superman, it works. it works out. I agree. So Mercy Graves from the wiki says, Lex Luthor's body got in chauffeur. Lex, Mercy Graves' past is unclear, but you know, in some incarnations, she's an Amazon. Uh, before she came to work for Lex Luthor, whether, whatever her origin, she found work as his bodyguard and assistant and has remained loyal to him for many years. Um, I don't think there's ever been a romance between the two, but you know, there's a certain level of devotion. And you know, I, I feel like that was a good thing to reinforce in this incarnation of mercy. And um, yeah, you know, the Native American delegation went with it and the fan cast was was pretty cool, I thought. Um, you might know this actress from The Mandalorian or you might know her from other roles. Let me go ahead and run a Google for that. She I'll admit, I only know her from The Mandalorian, but she's fantastic in that role. Oh, she was in the Twilight films as Leah Clearwater. She was also on Westworld, um, where she played Kohana. But yeah, those are two things I am not familiar with. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the, the Twilight. I think I have seen her in Westworld, and I definitely saw her in The Mandalorian. But um, yeah, she's a you know she's a very pretty woman. For I must if I if I can do that thing. Um, but yeah, listen, Julia Jones, unfortunately. The people only gave it a 66.6% approval rating, including 44.4% percent 
strongly approve, 22.2% somewhat approve, 0% somewhat disapprove, and 33.3% racist. 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 I know. It's really sad. Uh, shout out to Thomas Mission, one of the one of our followers, said, I just need more Julia Jones being awesome. And I agree. We should and, all and, for that. And, and, you know, as we were saying, we were turning a leaf. Mercy Graves is one of those characters that DC got right when it comes to portraying a woman in this in the superhero world. She's never she's never wildly sexualized. Mm -hmm. And she's always seen as someone who holds a commanding presence. She's I never, agree. she is, you know, and, 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 and DC can definitely do female characters right. So that, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a great transition from the Sue Dibney talk. Yeah. Ugh. And, uh, you know, obviously in the DC um, film universe, we got a Mercy Graves. I believe she was portrayed by an Asian actress. Um, unfortunately, she died. But maybe we won't pretend. Maybe we'll pretend that that never happened, in, in going forward, because you know, she kind of got done a little bit dirty, as far as getting an opportunity to shine. However, next up, the next allegation. Shout out to Carlos, Renee Montoya. Big fan of Renee Montoya. They actually uh, also provided a fan cast. Rosalind Sanchez, are you familiar with the actress? Yeah, she is a she's a great actress, and and I can see that hardened Renee Montoya, uh, you know, hardened longtime detective of the of the Gotham City uh, police force. I, I could definitely mm -hmm. see it. Yeah, and in current storylines, I believe she's the, if not the commissioner, the police chief. You know, she's she's in a in a very prominent role in the Batman stories, obviously in other incarnation, well, in the same incarnation, but other uh, points in her timeline, she has been a superhero in her own right. But we know this is the supplemental draft. So we're trying to focus on them in their role as, as a um, supplemental and or secondary characters. So I'll go ahead and read from the wiki. Wiki, wiki, wiki. <laughs> <laughs> Whether as a hard-hitting cop of the GCPD or the mysterious faceless vigilante known as a question, Renee Montoya is devoted to cleaning up the streets of Gotham within the law and, if necessary, outside of it. Renee Montoya was first introduced to the world in Batman animated series as a morally strong, virtuous, and open-minded beat cop partner to the oafish and outspoken Harvey Bullock on the Gotham City Police Department. Whereas Bullock placed no faith in Batman's capacity as protector of Gotham City, Montoya was willing to give him a chance to work on along, alongside them as long as their alliance continued to be productive. Though their early, through, through her early experiences, Renee Montoya earned the distinction of being one of the few police officers in Gotham City whom Batman can trust. It was perhaps this cautious trust in the mask operatives Sorry, in mask operatives, which eventually made Montoya a prime candidate for vigilante, vigilante, the vigilantism herself. And I'm going to, you know, like I said, the question stuff is outside of the scope of the supplemental draft. But Renee Montoya, um, I think what was not mentioned is that Renee Montoya is a lesbian. And I believe she had a romance with, with Batwoman. Yes, yeah, in the, in the beginning of the Batwoman storylines, yeah. And and it's always funny that people always remember that Harley Quinn came from Batman the Animated Series, but it's like everyone forgot that Renee, Mont Renee Montoya also came from that fantastic Bruce Timm series. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's because, like, you know, Harley Quinn is, is like, a much bigger character, um, you know, b between the cosplay, between the different movies that she's been in. Um, but yeah, Renee Montoya is nothing to, to you know sneeze at as well. And of yeah, course, it just a further it just further it further solidifies that the Batman the anim animated series is just a masterful piece of work. I it's so good. Yeah, no, that's true. So let's hear from the people. Do you think the people let us down, Gordy? I think I think that Renee Montoya remaining Latinx should be 
one of the an overwhelming favorite with maybe with maybe one vote dissenting. <laughs> so, eighty eight point two percent approval rating, with all eighty eight point two percent strongly approved, but eleven point eight percent clearly racist. Clearly, nope. racist. I mean that's rough. That's that's rough. But you know. There are always going to be haters. Yeah, you're right. Always going to be haters. It's sad, sad. I mean, this is a situation where it's not even a race bend, and and uh, apparently there was someone <laughs> out there was someone out there that was like, no, no, we got it, we got it, we got a, we got a white, we got a whitewasher. Uh, shout out to uh, Brandon, oh, sorry, Brandos OS on Twitter, aka Doskinowski, who gave. A slow clap gif in response to the draft pick, and 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 I uh, concur. But next yeah, up, I mean, listen, listen, the listen. You have to remember too, the Latinx is the uh, leading points getter. So there may be some just some secret hate to see them mm. not win and be fantastic at everything. Maybe, maybe it's just some um, some hateration and holleration in the stancery. Um, next up, the Polynesian delegation. This, I got to admit, this is one of the few characters that I have never heard of up until now. The Polynesian delegation drafted Agent Michael Deems from S.W.O.R.D. Now, Gordy, have you ever heard of this character? Nothing. I, I, I did not know that S.W.O.R.D. Had, had agents besides those that are featured with Abigail Brand. Well, they certainly provided a fan cast. And if you compare the picture to the fan cast, it's actually a pretty nice fit. Um, you might know yeah. Tamura yeah. Morrison from his time playing either Aquaman's dad or his time playing Boba Fett in um, in the current Star Wars universe. But uh, that's the fan cast. I'll go ahead and read from the wiki. Agent of Sword. Born Michael Deems. Deems grew up in Los Angeles with a father from Zambia and a mother from the States. He lived, in a, he mis, lived a modest life. At a young age, he excelled in every major class in high school, won trophies and championships from Milton, Milton High School. Michael dreamed of working in space after finishing high school, so he went to S.H.I.E.L.D. to do training in weapons mastery, and he quickly became the best student in his class and was prompted as an agent of S.W.O.R.D. And that's uh, Agent Wow. Dean. We have been joined by, from the Latinx delegation, Carlos. Carlos, oh. you just missed out on your supplemental pick, which was Renee Montoya. Do you have any I was thoughts? Say remind me. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about Renee Montoya? Uh, Renee Montoya is, she's the only, like, one of three members of the GCPD I can name. <laughs> um but uh you know what it was honestly i was looking at um the fantasy scoring and i kept seeing commissioner montoya coming up that's right because she's commissioner. Like, you know what? She, she deserves she deserves to get drafted because she's putting up more points than commissioner gordon so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ex ex commissioner gordon yes right exactly exactly yeah and i don't know if you noticed but you got an 88.2 percent approval rating including all 88.2 strongly approved. All right. And but, then Gordy? But the, yeah, exactly. The, the racism in the strongly disapprove. Um, how, do you, but, how do you disapprove of Lat Latinx Renee Montoya? I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please, please speak to your leading point uh, <laughs> scorer of the week with respect. Mr. Oh, is that right? I can't... Yeah, yeah, I'm going yeah. to yeah. run down. I'm going to run down the points totals uh, for you real quick. The for goddamn the week, Jonathan since you're here. <laughs> So 17 points for the Jewish delegation, 21 points for the Polynesian delegation, tw tied with 24, for the Native American and South Asian delegation, uh, 30 points for the East Southeast Asian delegation, 35 points for the Latinx delegation, okay. 42 points for the Black delegation, 45 points the multiracial delegation Damn. and 48 points for the white delegation 
That Led means I'm by, up by ten by by five points on the multiracial delegation. Yes, you are. Oh no. Five point lead holding holding it down. <laughs> but here so I, it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough to see it play out. So let's move on to the next delegation, which I believe is the black delegation. Oh wait, I did not say the approval rating. I did not say the approval rating for the for the Polynesian delegation and Agent Weems. Uh, sixty six point seven percent approval, and then thirty three point three percent. Sorry, sixty six point seven percent strongly approve, and then thirty three point three percent strongly disapprove. So racist, obviously. Some shocking split of the vote so evenly there. <laughs> but that brings us to the black delegation who selected the person that I like to call the uh, black power broker um, Sharon Carter after uh, we've all watched the we've all watched uh, Winter Falcon who you have thoughts I love that the MCU fans cannot let go or the Marvel fans cannot let go of Sharon Karen Carter, and now that she's evil, she has to be a scroll. <laughs> That's just the only explanation that they will allow is that she is a scroll, and this isn't the real Sharon Carter, which is ridiculous. Sharon well, Carter is evil is a more interesting uh, character than one hundred percent agree. But like I said, like I said, you know, in our little chat, uh, she's Karen Carter, uh, and because <laughs> she could not speak to a manager, she decided to become a manager herself. Um, that seems like a very simple explanation uh, as a visual, villain origin story um, for Karen Carter as a power broker, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to it. I think uh, I think it's great that Sharon Carter, had they been drafted by the Black delegation in the proper draft, would have scored more points than Krakoa just on Winter Falcon appearances alone. That is factually correct not to mention the fact that she's scoring a ton of points in the captain america book wow um, because i believe she is not only used the iron patriot armor but she is also taken like a super soldier serum um but like yeah uh yeah sharon carter is, is putting points on the board and the black delegation you know got got in on that late but i'll go ahead and read from the wiki 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 Inspired by the tales of Captain America and her Aunt Margaret, Sharon Carter decided to become an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And um, yeah, that's uh, Sharon Carter from the wiki. That's the whole wiki? <laughs> yeah, they didn't. I mean, there's there's more. There's like a, a whole origin, you know. Okay, okay. I mean, I'll do it. I'll go ahead. It's, not, it's just it's a short paragraph. When Sharon's aunt Peggy Carter returned from World War II, she told Sharon about the many adventures she would go on with the French resistance, which inspired Sharon to decide to join S.H.I.E.L.D. Given the codename Agent 13, her fish, first mission was to retrieve an explosive called Inferno 42 from a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who had stolen it from them, which I guess is an acronym. After Sharon retrieved the explosive, a mercenary named Batrock was hired by them to steal it back. Luckily, Captain America had come just in time to help her. And while Captain America and Batrock were fighting each other, she ran off. Little did she know that the casing had been cracked, activating the explosive. Captain America had found out that Sharon was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent and that saved her from the explosive and them. Now, what they don't say after is that uh, Captain America gave her the D. Um, and <laughs> I don't know. I think they did say he came right on time. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this is a classic example of you know uh, a, a family member telling you how good the D is, and then you decide to uh, try it out for yourself. And there is a long history of Sharon Carter getting it on with Captain America in the books. Um, was not played out quite the same way in the MCU. Which is why you know, um, you know, Sharon's like a power broker now. Do you do you think that in their their heart of hearts, the powers that be regret casting Emily Van Camp for Sharon Carter? Um, what do you mean? Like she's not quite that caliber of actress. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. like I don't want to say she's a bad actress because she's a perfectly fine TV actress, mm -hmm. but but. If you're gonna have her be this kind of like 
power Matt broker. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. Doesn't it feel like that should have been a higher profile actress? Well, I kind of feel like, I mean, you know, not to get too deep into our Wonder Falcon talk, but I kind of feel like they, once they realized how much of a firecracker um, Peggy Carter was, and um, why am I struggling with the actress's name? Like, um, oh man, Peggy, you just spread it to me. Yeah, exactly. Like Haley <laughs> Atwater? No, Haley, Haley Atwell. Haley Atwell. Haley Atwell, thank you. Um, like, after that, I think that they, I think she set such a high bar that there was probably no one they could cast to carry on and exceed Haley Atwell. So I think that a lot of the writers, without really knowing it, realized that they, they, they you know, the end game, so to speak, for Captain America was always to end up with Peggy, which is a lot different from her arc, you know, uh, from his arc in the comics. So I think that Sharon was kind of like hung out to dry in that respect. So in a lot of ways, putting putting her in the role of the power broker is is a bit of a consolation prize in the sense. Like we don't know what we're doing with Sharon Carter. Like Right. So Yeah, I, I just it just kind of feels like normally the MCU gets either huge names or actors who are about to be really huge mm. and i cannot give you another credit of emily van camps since winter soldier like yeah her appearances I, in the marvel I have universe no idea is, where else she's been other than this right but at the same time you know i don't i don't think she's acted the role poorly sure you know so i'm keeping my fingers crossed and i'm hoping that in this new role you know, she does her thing. However, that has taken us off of our fan casting, which the Black delegation was, you know, nice enough to give us. And I think as I think that's is a perfect fan casting for the role of potentially the power broker, which is Kerry Washington, who you might know from a little show called Scandal. I like and that. Also, I like that also, she's 20 years older than, than Emily Van Camp. I, I, I love that. Yeah. So the people gave a, a uh, approval rating. That approval rating is 84.6%, including 76.9% strongly approve, 7.7% somewhat approve, 0% somewhat disapprove, and 15.4% racist. <laughs> Some of us don't want to see Sharon Carter leave the uh, the white delegation. I mean, are you saying you'd rather see her as a scroll than black? Is this what we're is this where we're at right now? <laughs> she 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 subscribes to the eight to the age old uh, white saying of if you can't keep it in your pants, keep it in the family. So oh God, wow, to see where she is. <laughs> Wow, I've never wow. heard that saying before, but um, would you like to repeat that for the um, the the prosecutors? Um, hey, listen, <laughs> listen, I didn't write it, okay? I don't live it, but it is something that has definitely been brought up before. And with mm -hmm. Sharon and Peggy Carter sharing a man, uh, it's, it's definitely something that's been done in practice in both the MCU and the Marvel 616 universe. So, yeah. And to be fair, in the M in the six one six comic universe, Peggy Carter is is somehow alive. You know, like she's she's in the present day, and yep. And and there is they have not talked about the awkwardness of uh, Peggy Carter and Sharon Carter uh, being uh, Eskimo sisters. <laughs> At, like ask like literally an Eskimo. Uh, family for lack of a better term that yeah yeah so yeah so you know what sharon carter and her all of her filthy nasty kinkiness deserve <laughs> to stay in the white delegation well you should have you should have drafted sharon carter for exactly that. you had a pick you could have gone for karen carter and it would have been it would have been right there ah uh, yeah 
damn me and my my need to highlight DCs in an uh, awkward moment. But not, not to spoil anything, but I think that the uh, I think that I love the pick because of who gets picked next. Mm. If I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, the Polynesian pick is next. No, 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 no. The next pick, no, you missed the Polynesian pick. The oh, uh, no, the next pick is the multiracial delegation. The multiracial delegation selected the Masters, which yes, from a from a fan. Yes, cap- okay, okay. Yes, the multiracial delegation co- selected Alicia Masters, aka Alicia Masters Grimm, aka the wife of the thing, which means uh, she gets her rocks off. Um, and <laughs> wow. <laughs> And the fan casting was Yara Shah- Shahidi. Yep. Which is, uh, you know, you might know her in Blackish. But she, isn't this also the role that Carrie, Carrie Washington played in the Fantastic Four? It was the role right? that Carrie so, Washington played in the uh, early Fantastic Four movie. I uh, love that movie. Brief Fantastic Four movie. I totally forgot that. Uh huh. Kerry Washington was in that was in those movies. That's right. I kind of didn't notice Kerry Washington before the movie Ray. So she did. She Kerry Washington did have that sort of character actress uh, Mm -hmm. where you didn't notice her and stuff until later, and she became a a that guy. She's like, oh, it's that guy again. Right. So I'll go ahead and read from the wiki. A blind sculptor and friend of the Fantastic Four, she is married to Ben Grimm, the thing, and also the stepdaughter of the supervillain Puppet Master. And yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know how it's supposed to work from a physical standpoint, um, her her married to Ben Grimm, but if you like it, I love it, is what I say. Um, the people, though, they had a take. They gave it a 90% approval rating with all 90% strongly approve and all 10% strongly disapprove. So they're racist. Yes. Any other thoughts about uh, about multiracial Alicia Masters, Grimm? Uh, this is an actress who I love and who I kind of hope gets into comic book movies sooner rather than later Mm -hmm. um she would have like would have been my pick for riri williams i mean age-wise i think she was kind of like a little bit out of the the range but i I feel that yeah yeah i think that this is something that we can we'll be on the ground floor that everyone will look back at in a few years and go yeah of course she's whatever character she's going to kill mm-hmm. in a CU or a CEU. Right. Right. And the final pick of the round from the East Southeast Asian delegation, a little character who you would not call Dr. Strange because there's already a Dr. Strange, but he's Dr. Hugo Strange from the, uh, the Batman mythos. And he was already played by B.D. Wong on the Gotham series, which is why the fan casting uh, stays intact. East Southeast Asian delegation played by B.D. Wong, Hugo Strange. I'll go read from the wiki. Dr. Hugo Strange is a brilliant but disturbed psychologist with an obsessive vendetta against Batman. In addition to being one of Batman's earliest foes, preceding even the Joker and Catwoman He's one of the first and few to successfully deduce that Batman and Bruce Wayne are one and the same. What did you guys think about this pick, the East Southeast Asian delegation? I love B.D. Wong, uh, period, the god B.D. Wong. Um, And Hugo Strange is is a character who hasn't really gotten his due in the in the film franchises, but has mm-hmm. been explored in the video games mm-hmm. and television, Cartoons, yeah. yeah, you know, like, it, and has been done well. Um, so I, I, I understand why you wouldn't put him in to a movie as the main villain. Um, but, and, and I, I totally get, he is more of a television villain because it's more of an intimate medium. Uh, but BD, yeah, BD Wong, knocks that role out of the park i think because he's 
he is so like good at being like you feel all of the emotions for bd wong like almost at all times like you're scared of him you're scared for him you feel for like it's it's you feel for him you know like it, he's, he's able to 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 evoke all of that uh and like you know we we brought up mr robot like he's always going to be white rose to me mm-hmm. um and he was i think i think he was fantastic in that role um problematic though it may be uh right i think he i think he you know acted his ass off in that role um so i i think that would be if they ever did bring a hugo strange to the movies i would not be mad if it was bd wong yeah i agree you know and i i was i was a huge fan of gotham uh i know that that's not that that's not the coolest thing for anybody to say but I think uh, I think Gotham Gotham sort of encapsulized the fantastic campiness of Batman, and BD Wong was superb. He dialed up the camp in a way that I honestly was surprised from a guy that I've been watching since I think what Prince uh, uh, Father of the Bride is the earliest I can remember seeing him in 1991. Wow. Uh, he. Yeah. He he was fantastic in Gotham in the role, and if it were, if it were to carry to uh, the more serious DC universe and the more serious Batman projects projects, I think he would. I think he would also handle that spectacularly. Um, he, he, he's sort of in my head. He his his Gotham characterization of Hugo Strange has become the de facto human strain. Excuse me, Hugo Strange for me. So yeah, I mean, I had already ejected from Gotham by the time uh, Hugo Strange was introduced to the show, so I never got an opportunity to see how he played it, but, you know, I'm a big fan of the actor. I am also a huge fan of Mr. Robot, so I can see it, but, you know, I just couldn't couldn't do it, couldn't, couldn't go back through other scenes of Gotham to, to make it work for me. But, yeah, I got Gotham was a Gotham was a bit of a hard watch, I will admit. But it t- once once you sort of gave in to the premise and gave in to some of the because there were fantastic characterizations on Gotham and there were some really horrible ones. But uh, but yeah, as long as you just just sort of ignored the re- some of the some of the real bad stuff, it had it it definitely had some hidden gems. And mm-hmm. Hugo Strange, played by B.D. Wong, it would be right at the top of the list. But that's it. That's the end of the round. Uh, you know, we're about to kick off in, in just a couple hours of the uh, supplemental draft, the next round of supplemental draft. We still have three more weeks of FCL scoring. It's going to be interesting to see how how the season plays out in that respect. And, you know, with the, with our FCL scoring comes more supplemental picks. Um, I'm going to, you know, we'll talk. We'll talk offline about some of the plans that we have for subsequent seasons. Uh, the new season will probably kick off in June. Um, and, you know, there'll be a handful of tweaks. Season four, I'm, I'm, I'll, per, I'll, I'll put this out there for, for, for you guys since you're here and for the listeners to give your takes. I think we might do auction style in season four. You don't, you don't, uh, just saying, as a member of the fantasy community, we don't say auction style anymore. Yes, yes. Players because of the players. implications. Yes. We we say salary cap. That's yes. the that's yes. the that is the player. acceptable. Yes. Um, yeah. That so we, said, when it's time for me to nominate a player for salary <laughs> cap bidding, I am going to say, we have here one large, strong character. Look at those muscles, perfect for lifting. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, not in season three. Season three, we, we're gonna we're gonna stick to our conventional conventional rules. But season four, look ahead, listeners. Or uh, get ready for the salary cap game, or an auction, if you will. As uh, so, there's three more weeks of scoring. I thought there were two more weeks of scoring. Uh, so oh, this man. is I'm this scared. is week seven, and there's eight, nine, and ten. Oh my god! You know, like it, when we were nearing the end of the draft, and you were like, <laughs> "Do you want to go from eight weeks to ten weeks?" And I said, "Yeah." Immediately, 
part of my brain is like, you're going to regret that, Carlos. <laughs> and now it's like, I got to hold on to a five point lead for three weeks. <laughs> well, I mean, hey, this is the I'm first week that, the that Wonder Woman put up no points. You missed that. <laughs> I know. The first week, I think, ever. Wow. That dog is really upset about that. <laughs> that dog is a huge Wonder Woman fan. Like, don't do not show that dog Wonder Woman eighty four. Is what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> Listen, his name is AJ, and he is very upset that Wonder Woman did not do well. I mean, it is it is bothering him to his core. But I guess that takes us to the end of our show, guys. I mean, do you have any last uh, last thoughts? Uh, bringing it all together. I can say uh, three weeks to go. I'm 30 points off the lead. So I've got to make up 10 points a week. Uh, I, I put this in the hands of Colossus. I need him to show up, <laughs> show up knock some stuff over, you know, randomly just, just pick up like the ebony blade and be like, hey, what's this thing do? Uh, <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I I for for the white delegation, I can definitely say that this has been this has been fun. Everything has been great, and this is probably finally the week where we're gonna stop drafting women that were raped and or murdered. That's uh, good. I, I believe that I believe we've highlighted enough of the horribleness of comics, and we will just have some fun drafting some Karens and some racists the rest of the way. Nice, nice. Uh, I can say that, uh, I am consulting with some attorneys to get the fantasy scoring league to accept Batman detective as a canon book. Uh, we are, we are mounting our, our case currently and, uh, we'll see you in court. <laughs> nice. I love, I love when the racial draft uh, prompts litigation. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll get some really cool picks this week. Hopefully we won't get any, any superheroes that are masquerading as supplemental, supplemental picks. Um, <laughs> Cause that's, that's, that's always a tough spot for me in the role of, uh, of commissioner. Um, I thought that Kia was going to pop in um, with her, her brand of shenanigans. That just means we'll probably get double the shenanigans next week. So if you're a fan of Kia shenanigans, that's the show you want. And if this is your first show, as always, I apologize. But if you want to check out our other older shows, you can find us on um, all your podcast platforms on Anchor, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you find podcasts, you can find the Racial Draft Podcast. On social media, you can find us at Racial Draft Pod on Twitter, Racial Draft on Facebook, Racial Dot Draft on Instagram. We're not yet on TikTok, but we'll 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 think about it. Um, I think there's some Clubhouse things happening before Clubhouse goes goes under completely. Um, we're not going to do some Snapchats. Follow our uh, various uh, recaps. We're we're still doing round by round, a uh, little little slideshow musical recaps. Uh, you know, go ahead and look at those and share those. You know, we, we, we're trying to do big things in the coming season and, you know, but go back and listen to the past seasons, figure out how we got here and enjoy us and, and tell your friends because, you know, we're not going anywhere. We're, we're here. We're here. We're, we're doing our thing. Um, you know, but again, if you're a part of a delegation and you feel like the de delegation is not being done justice, hit either hit the main account up or hit up one of your delegates and and say you know do better we got some characters that need to be highlighted there's a there's a season like i said in in june we're kicking off a new season if you want to have your voice heard if you want to be part of a delegation if you want to be part of our community hit me up mtf iii um gordy go ahead and give your russian bot uh social media handle Right, it's Gordy nine two four one nine five five two, and I think I'm doing that from memory, so it might not be right. But <laughs> All right, uh, Carlos in, in the chats. Uh, Carlos, <laughs> uh, I'm at Carlos Freites Jr. Freites is F R E Y T E S, and uh, that's me on Twitter. 
Um, I have an Instagram allegedly. I don't <laughs> utilize it. I, isn't it like uh, Big Los like, or whatever? I don't, <laughs> I don't eat interesting enough meals to get into really justify my Instagram. But uh, hit me up on Twitter. I'm always around. Yes. And, uh, you know, follow Follow us for our racial draft commentary, but also, you know, if you're an MCU fan, we have our, our MCU shows that we are doing our recaps on. We're taking a little bit of a break, but maybe we'll pop in for a scroll cast as we talk about like which, which characters are definitely uh, Skrulls and or Mephisto. Um, and, but follow us. Um, what's, what's the word? Subscribe to our platform was it like and subscribe if you're new mm-hmm. um and and do that so that you can get our, our earliest content as soon as it drops um support us on patreon support us on only fans at the facial draft and <laughs> but until next time all things are possible mm-hmm.